When someone drops a wrench on a concrete floor, we're not likely to mistake its sound for that of a baseball bat hitting the floor. This is because the two objects vibrate differently when they strike the floor. Tap a wrench or a baseball bat and the vibrations of each are different from the vibrations of other objects. Any object composed of an elastic material when disturbed will vibrate at its own special set of frequencies, which together form its unique sound. Some objects, like bells and tuning forks, vibrate predominantly at one frequency, called natural frequency. The natural frequency depends on such factors as the elasticity and shape of the object. Interestingly, most things from planets to atoms and almost everything in between have a springiness to them and vibrate at one or more natural frequencies. Musical instruments all have natural frequencies. A piano with its 88 strings has 88 different natural frequencies. The natural frequency for a cello or a guitar depends on where the player's fingers are placed. A full and pleasing musical note has other frequencies called harmonics added to the natural frequency. When an object is forced to vibrate and the frequency of the applied force matches the object's natural frequency, a dramatic increase in amplitude occurs. This phenomenon is called resonance. Literally, resonance means resounding or sounding again. Putty doesn't resonate because it isn't elastic. That is, it doesn't rebound when tapped or squeezed. And a dropped handkerchief is also not elastic. In order for something to resonate, it needs a force to pull it back to its starting position and enough energy to keep it vibrating. A common experience illustrating resonance occurs on a playground swing. When pushing manual on a swing, we push in rhythm with the natural frequency of the swing. Timing is important. Even small pushes delivered in rhythm with the natural frequency of the swinging motion produce large amplitudes. A common classroom demonstration of resonance is illustrated with a pair of tuning forks adjusted to the same frequency and spaced a meter or so apart. When Jill Johnson at City College of San Francisco strikes one of the matched frequency tuning forks, the other is set into vibration, into resonance. When a series of sound waves impinge from one fork to the other, each compression gives the prong of the fork a tiny push. Imagine a vibrating fork sending waves to a stationary second one. Stages encountered by the second fork are shown in these snapshots. In A, the first compression meets the tuning fork and gives it a tiny and momentary push. In B, the fork bends, and in C, returns to its original position just at the time a rarefaction arrives and in D, overshoots in the opposite direction. Just when the fork returns to its initial position, E, the next compression arrives to repeat the cycle. Now it bends farther because it's moving. The motion of this second fork is often called a sympathetic vibration. If the forks are not adjusted for matched frequencies, the timing of pushes is off and resonance will not occur. When you tune a radio, you are similarly adjusting the natural frequency of the electronics to match one of the many incoming surrounding signals. The set then resonates to one station at a time instead of playing all stations at once. A classic case of resonance gone wrong is the collapse of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in the previous century. Wind-generated resonance brought the bridge crashing into the river beneath. Its replacement with structural changes takes its place and stands today in the state of Washington. The effects of resonance are all around us. Resonance underscores not only the sound of music, but the color of autumn leaves, the motion of ocean waves and ocean tides, and the operation of lasers, and a vast multitude of phenomena that add to the beauty of the world. I want to leave you with a question. Why will a struck tuning fork sound louder when its bottom is held against a table? Until next time, good resonance.